I apologize for all of you. I was just giving a lecture at the, here in the ancient biblical museum in Jerusalem. You can never guess about what. It was about the question, who built the pyramids? We are just now before uh, Pesach. And uh, I saw the audience, all the people, they, they were shocked. Some of them were shocked to understand uh, that the Jewish uh, ancient people, Hebrews, they did not the one who built uh, the, the ancient pyramids in uh, in Egypt, because of one reason, there was one reason for that. The, the all the ancient myths of the birth of the Hebrew and the Israelite the nation in Egypt uh, happened uh, only one thousand years after the pyramids were built in uh, Giza of today, which is southwest uh, to Cairo. And anyhow, the, the the area that the Israeli, the ancient Israelites in the Egypt was not at the area of Cairo and Giza of today. It was in the area of uh, Goshen, a Hebrew name from the biblical times, that was in a different area. It's in the northeast of uh, the triangle, the, the, de the famous uh, delta. So uh, we have the myth of Pesach, which is related to the history, yet the pyramids themselves are a kind of um, a mystery. Uh, we don't know everything about the pyramids, uh, who, who exactly and how did they build them? Yet, one thing is for sure, and I apologize again, not for my delay, I apologize now for uh, being a party pooper, that uh, while we're sitting in a week from now for the Pes Pesach, Leila Seder, we should know that the pyramids were built by uh, other slaves from Asia, from uh, Africa, but not the Hebrew people, due to the uh, uh, gap of time between the history when they were built, that is in the 24th century BC, and the 14th century BC, that is the time where the Hebrew uh, story uh, with Moses in Egypt. So what I will speak today is about, we're going to have some a glimpse of uh, ancient Egypt of today, uh, how it looks today, and specialize on the ancient historical sites that they are very uh, well known. Yes, I, I'm sure that some of you have visited the Egypt. Just to let you know about the situation of Egypt today, Egypt is uh, out of the COVID also now. I mean, just as many other countries, the relations with Israel are uh, flourishing. We are in a very good situation uh, uh, in the economy, in the tourism. Uh, it's very hard to get a, a seat in the flight, a daily flight from Tel Aviv to, to Cairo. And also uh, the relationships between the politicians and the decision makers are, are very warm. I mean, the Israeli Prime Minister, Mr. Bennett, uh, he met uh, pres uh, Egyptian President uh, Assisi uh, three times in the last uh, six months. And the relationships uh, seems to be uh, very good. So we all hope it will continue like that because Egypt is a land of wonders. Every time I'm traveling in Egypt more than 22 uh, years, and I've been there dozens of times. It's it's so close to Israel. It's so related. There's no other country that is so related to our uh, origins and to our legacies and to our the main the main narrative. The main narrative where the Hebrew people were, were born. Our nation was born in Africa. We need to say it in Egypt. The, the leader of the Hebrew nation was an African uh, leader. That is uh, Moses. So what I will do today, I will show you some of the main. Uh, attractions, uh, tourist attractions, yet also archaeological attractions, who are still uh, uh, under uh, research. And next week, we're going to talk about the modern Egypt and uh, some connections to the uh, Hebrew uh, modern culture, like the uh, Geniza and the new synagogues uh, in Cairo and in Alexandria. So after I'm giving a hug and a kiss to uh, Mr. Sphinx in Giza, Let's go and jump to the next slide. Um, I, I'm wondering, I, I guess you can read the, the Hebrew word over there on the right side. This is Mitzrayim. You know, Mitzrayim in Hebrew, we need to say, uh, Hebrew is the only language in the world that has a real historical, ge 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 geological, sorry, geopolitical history in the name of this country. Take a look at the word. It says Mitzrayim. It's like there is a, a double objects here. It's like Michnasayim or Misparaim or Mishkafaim, something which is two here. So what do we have here too? We have two 
Meitzar. Meitzar in Hebrew is a strait, like the Straits of Gibraltar, who are very famous. In Egypt, we have one, actually one long strait like that, that is the Nile, as you can see it on the left. And the Nile is arriving from uh, Central Africa. It has two sources, one in Ethiopia, that's the main source of the water coming from Ethiopia, and the other one is on the equator in, in Uganda. So these are the, the Blue Nile from Ethiopia, the, the White Nile from Uganda, they are combining together, they are joining together in uh, Khartoum, which is in Sudan, and then they are going up, floating up to the north to Cairo. All the way from uh, Sudan to Cairo, this is Upper Egypt, or this is one Meitza, one strait. I'm saying Meitza because it's a huge uh, uh, body of water that is separated between the Eastern Desert and the Western Desert in, of Egypt. Then when it gets to Cairo, take a look at uh, uh, Delta on the left, you could see that it's, this is the lower Egypt. So when we say in Hebrew, Mitzrayim, we, we mean that we have two Meitzars, Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. And uh, Hebrew is the only name that we have this story of those two Meitzarim. Even in Arabic, the Arabs in uh, Egypt, when they call the name of their country, they don't say uh, two Meitzah, they call it Misr in Arabic, which means only one Meitzah. So what is the whole story here about? The whole story is that in the year, and if we go to the next uh, slide, please, Arya. Uh, maybe the, the next one. No, no, the, the Mina House. The Mina House is fine. The Mina House Hotel. Guys, whenever you reach uh, Egypt and Cairo, the best hotel in those places, and, and I don't get, I don't give any uh, commissions for that, uh, is the Mina House Hotel, which is just uh, in front of the ancient pyramids. Um, I took this photo exactly two years ago when we started to visit, uh, revisit Egypt again after the COVID was uh, a bit low. And... I show you this not only before, because of the reflection of the pyramid or the beauty of this uh, colonial beautiful hotel, because uh, I, I show it to you because of the name. The name is Mena House. Mena is a name of a king. It's the first king. I think you can see him on the next uh, slide, Arya. This is the King Menes or Mena. He, he ruled Egypt in the year, in the time of 3,100 years BC. And he was the one who joined those two Egypts. The Upper Egypt, coming from Africa, and the Lower Egypt. That is uh, the delta that is flowing to the Mediterranean Sea. It's not uh, an obvious thing to do. He made a political uh, decision. And this is why he was so famous and he was so... Uh, beloved by all the kings, the, I mean, the, the, the other kings who will uh, approach uh, later on. So on his name is also this uh, new hotel from the 19th century. Yet he's the one who unified Egypt more than 5,000 years ago. And he made it a one a united uh, country. And before that, something like 2,000 years before his time, Egypt was kind of a um, tribes here and there, in the lower Egypt, in the upper Egypt, somewhere in still in the desert. He was the one who made it uh, unified. And from his time, that is from 3100 BC, we, we all start to, um, to measure or to talk about the, new, the history of uh, Pharaonic or ancient Egypt. Now, Arya, if you please, if you can go up, please, to the uh, former uh, slide of the time schedule. Here, thank you. Here we see the history, the timeline of uh, of Egypt. Take a look from the it's, it goes from the left to uh, to the right to our times. Uh, in Egypt, we talk about millenniums. Egypt is one of the old, uh, oldest uh, civilizations in the world. Uh, we start to count its history at the pre dynastic or the early dynastic on the left. Uh, that is uh, three thousand years ago at the time of the unification of Menas. Then we go to um, uh, decades, or decades, or uh, 
periods in the history of Egypt, as you can see, the old kingdom, let's say, on the left, it's, you see, uh, is very much symbolized at the time that the king Cheops, he was the one who built the, uh, one of the first uh, pyramids in Giza, the famous ones. Then we have uh, the other kings and uh, the peak, I mean, uh, uh, the, the time where Egypt was so big, it was the time it was, when you call it the new kingdom. That is more or less in the century, the 15 to or the 17 or to 15 centuries BC. That's the time of uh, King uh, Tutankhamun. That's the time of uh, Nefertari, the wife of Ramesses II, the very famous one. In, in one week from now, we're going to read the Haggadah of Pesach. We're going to talk about the Pharaoh, uh, a, sp a very specific one. That Pharaoh is named Ramses II. His wife was called one of his uh, 100 uh, wives. Her name was uh, Nefertari, not Nefertiti. Nefertiti is the mother of Tutankhamun, just uh, 100 years uh, before that. Anyhow, in the time of Ramses II, that's the time of the new kingdom. At that time, Egypt was uh, capturing uh, lands and areas up to the north, to Turkey of today, uh, Canaan, which is the Eretz Israel, uh, as we know it today, and also to the south, to Africa, to Ethiopia, and to the west, to Libya. It was a huge kingdom. Then came other uh, periods, uh, when Libyans uh, ruled uh, Egypt, and then the Persians invaded from the east, and then everything uh, has collapsed in the year 331 BC when Alexander the Great, he, he invaded from, from Greece to uh, Egypt. And at that, at that time, uh, Egypt is entering a new period that is the Ptolemy uh, uh, time. And the last uh, very famous uh, 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 kings, actually, and the queen was Cleopatra VII. There was there were seven Cleopatra. They were not Egyptians. They were Egypt. They were Greek, but Cleopatra the seventh was the last ruler who was at the Greek period, and she she find she concluded three thousand years of the dynasties of the Egyptians of the pharaohs. Then came the Roman period. Uh, the Roman Empire also ruled Egypt. And it takes only, you don't see it here on this scale, on this timeline, For if, but if we go to the right side again, you would see the time of uh, the becoming of the Christianity. When Egypt became a Christian country, yes, it's hard to, um, to uh, uh, think of that today, but Egypt was a Christian country for something like 350 years, between the 4th century AD until the, the beginning of the 8th century AD, and then came the Islam. To that country. But we talk today when we speak about the ancient uh, pharaonic um, uh, history of Egypt, we talk about those 3,000 years from Menas until the Greek period, and there was something like one, uh, many, many hundreds of kings and uh, rulers uh, to rule the, that uh, place. So we have here the pyramid, double meaning, the pyramids of Cheops, the famous building we see ahead, and also the pyramid of the timeline of uh, of the Egyptian history. Uh, I don't know, Ari, about uh, your policy regarding uh, questions, but you can uh, we, you can pick up the questions and we can talk about them at the end of my talk if you like. It's up to you. Feel free. Well, we'll get to them at the end. Okay, so we can proceed, please. We all know, let's, let's, let's make a stop at the step pyramid. We all know the famous pyramids in Giza. Well, they, were not, they are not the first ones. What you see here, this is the first ever built uh, building, man-made in the world. It was built by uh, the first Egyptians. It, it's from the third and the fourth dynasty. That is um, in, in the 25th century BC. Um, it was made as a, at the beginning as a kind of a, as a, what is a pyramid? A pyramid is a tomb. So they wanted to take care to protect the, the tomb itself, which is underground and all the treasures of the king. So they made a kind of a, a closure to that uh, hole. And then they said, hey, why don't we make it a kind of a shape of, a, of an arrow? 
showing the direction to the sky, to the sun, in order to show that the king, after his death, he's went up to the sky and he has now a second life. So the pyramid has uh, two functions. First, physically, to take care of the treasures and the, and the tomb itself. And secondly, to show the direction of the second life, of the future, of the eternity, actually. So what we see here, it's the first ever made, ever built a pyramid. At the beginning, they used to build it like this, with their steps. Here we have uh, six steps. Each uh, step has uh, 10 meters uh, height. And this is the, the first uh, uh, step. Now, uh, the, the first uh, pyramid. After that, it will be much more uh, wise. They will take this model, all the architects, and they will close those steps. So today you don't see any steps anymore. I mean, in the other uh, pyramids. Um, let's go to the other uh, slide, please. What we see here, take a look. On the right side, you see the step pyramid that we just uh, spoke about it. But on the left side, what we see here, this is a, a, an entrance hall. Before you reach the, the tomb, of uh, the king, which is buried over there in that pyramid. His name, by the way, was Josel, King Josel, again. Uh, you need to pass through the hall. And that hall you see here is connected. It's a complex of buildings, uh, the most ancient man-made buildings in the world, 25th uh, century BC. Uh, ah, by the way, I think now in the United States, it's the, the, there was a release of that movie about Imhotep. Uh, that's, that step, that pyra step, uh, step pyramid, was planned and built by the first architect in the world. His name was Imhotep, or Emenhotep in Hebrew we call him. He, he was one of the first genius, genius persons in the world. And he was also, he was not only a builder and, and, and the, not only the first architect in the world. He was also the first uh, physician, the first doctor in a, a, a human history known as, as a physician. One of the amazing uh, characters. And as I said, as far as I know, I read that there's a new uh, movie about his life in Egypt. It's called Emin Hotep. And I think that the actor who's playing his uh, role is uh, Denzel Washington. So here in Israel, I haven't seen this uh, movie yet, but remember him, he's the builder of the first uh, building in the world, the Step Pyramid. Let's proceed, Arya. As you enter the, the tubes who are connected to the entrance hall, you see on the walls, you see lots of information. Well, today we read information on the web, on newspapers, radio, you know, all the, all the, the modern media. In ancient times, people used to get information from books. Before that, before there was a, a paper, uh, people got information and knowledge from uh, lectures and the rhetoric. And here in Egypt, the whole information was based on sculptures of on the walls. People were coming once or two times a year to visit the tomb, to give uh, 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 blessings to the king. So they saw on the walls what is happening in this kingdom. So here what, and we, we, they saw some scenes from the everyday lives and also things that are happened to the king. What we see here is a scene from the everyday lives of the ancient Egyptians. And just to, again, to give you the, 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 the age of what you see now on one of the walls, on the tombs near the tomb of the, near the step pyramid, this is a, a inscription, I mean, a, a wall from the 21 uh, century BC. That is more than 4,000 years ago. And we see here some people who are sailing with a boat on the Nile and they have uh, the papyrus on the right side. They have some uh, butterflies you can see there. Uh, this guy on the right side, he had no uh, budget for closing, as you can see. Everything is very free. Everything is, they, they want to share, they want to symbolize that everything is very uh, comfortable. They live in prosperity because uh, Egypt was a country of prosperity due to the fact that they had water all year round. They were not connected to the rain. 
and to other problems where no climate change at that time. And they had the water of the Nile all year round because it was coming from Ethiopia, which has uh, the sources of it and with a huge lake of Lake Tana. So the whole message of what you see on the walls is saying that Egypt is a wealthy country, Egypt is strong, and they are ruling their country with no enemies. And they were white. The, the enemies came only after 3,000 years. The, their first one was uh, where the Persians from the east and the Greeks from the north. Let's proceed to the new slide, please. Take a look. We are on the Nile. Here we see a very uh, a nice scene of uh, two uh, uh, hippopotamus. You see, we see a hippopotam. We see a crocodile on the right side. We see other fishes who are watching this uh, scene, etc., etc. You have lots, lots of uh, inscriptions like that uh, on the walls of the tubes over there. Let's proceed. And here he is. This is the unfinished or half damaged uh, statue of King Ramses II. Ramses II was uh, uh, he's the most uh, he's the stronger strongest uh, pharaoh. He was he's the pharaoh of our story of uh, of the Haggadah of Pesach. Um, he was ruling Egypt in the four, in the 14th century BC. He ruled Egypt. Uh, I mean, he, he passed away at the age of 92, and he ruled Egypt uh, for more than 67 years. He had more than 10, uh, 100 wives and many, many uh, children. Um, and he was the one who made Egypt uh, an empire on its uh, uh, climax. Um, take a look. Uh, this statue was before was standing, was standing uh, upright, but it fell down. The archaeologists are saying that it fell down something in the first century AD and they, they just uh, covered it. And then only the new modern age they just cleaned it and made it uh, for visitors that you can see it not right now. The location, if you ask, the location of this statue is in Memphis, but not in Tennessee. It's uh, in ancient Memphis. Memphis, many, many years before Memphis in Tennessee, uh, this Memphis is uh, actually one of the ancient capitals of ancient Egypt. Not Cairo. Cairo is the capital of uh, Islamic uh, Egypt, but Memphis is a name that the Greeks came gave to this place, to uh, this area, and where he was found here. Uh, and it also has a Hebrew name. If you read in the Bible, you will find more than six times the Hebrew word "mof," "mof," "mem," face of it, and "mof" became to be came to be Memphis on the language of the Greeks who arrived here. And it, that moth is one of the places where you can find lots of archeological stuff from the times that, were, that uh, she was the capital of Egypt. Today, it's an archeological site, just uh, half a, an hour drive south to Cairo. Let's proceed, please. Now we take uh, one hour flight from uh, Cairo to the south. And we reach to one of the most, uh, one of the famous uh, sites of Egypt, a well-known one, the Temple of Abu Simbel. The Temple of Abu Simbel originally was uh, not in this location. It was where today you see the, on the left, you see the Lake Nasser, which is a, a floating of the Nile. The Nile was floated, flooded because of uh, the dam, the dam of Aswan, which has uh, completed in 1970, in the year 1970. But in 1960, 10 years before that, the archeologists from all over the world, especially from Italy, from Britain, France, and from the United States, they rushed to Egypt to save, in order to save those ancient statues. And they built um, uh, an artificial hill, which you can see it on the right side, they cut, all the original statues of uh, Ramses II, and they just stole them inside with all the caves which are inside. So what you see here today, and what we visit today, is uh, 60 meters above the original location, which is today 
in the water. So uh, that was the beginning of UNESCO organization in 1963, 1964. The savings of uh, the temples of uh, the Nubian uh, desert in southern uh, Egypt. And this is the result. Let's go ahead and see some more uh, pictures of this beautiful place. Here we can see it from, uh, from close. Actually, it's a temple. It's a temple from the 14th century BC, which means more than 2,400 years ago. It's an, we see here um, uh, the, the painting. Here we see there are two uh, temples, actually. This temple here, this is the temple dedicated to Ramses II's uh, wife, to Queen Nefertari. So we here, you see here four statues of her uh, figure and other statues of her uh, servants. It is all cut and made in the in the limestone of the of the desert over there. And, and remember again, what you see here is uh, it's not artificial, but it was cut and rebuilt again in this artificial uh, hill in Abu Simbel. Let's go ahead. In, this, in these pictures, you can see the work which started, as I said, in 1962 and ended at 1968. The cutting and the rebuilding again, uh, all the statues of uh, those two temples over there, uh, just to give you the dimensions, the, the height of the statues of Ramses II, as you can see in these pictures, is more than 22 meters. And you have four of them. And you have also an entry to the hall, to the inner part of that uh, temple. It's, it's one of the biggest projects of UNESCO ever. <laughs> Anyhow, we need to say this is the beginning of the philosophy of UNESCO, the organization, to save and to preserve uh, heritage sites all over the world. Since then, we're doing this. Uh, many countries are signed on the treaty of uh, take care, taking care of heritage sites all over the world. And Abu Simbel is uh, uh, the main project. This is the, the flag of UNESCO of that time. Let's go ahead. Here we go inside the temple. It's not just a statue which is outside on the facade. We go inside and here you can see uh, the inscriptions and the information and the stories about the kings and uh, uh, Ramses II and all his wives and how rich he is and what he's doing for his uh, nation, etc., etc. Let's go ahead. We are still inside of the temple of Ramses II in Abu Simbel. Here we can see on the right side uh, a scene from a very famous historical battle that uh, Ramses II uh, led uh, in front of one of the ancient nations, which was called the Hittites, Chitim in Hebrew. It was the Battle of Kadesh in the year uh, 1274 BC. Kadesh is today in the area of uh, Syria, northern to Israel. And you can see on the right side how he's pushing with his fist, uh, how he's pushing uh, the enemy. Um, on the left side, you can see the celebrations that were made after that. He said it was a victory, but the historian said that there, were quite, there was not a victory of Egypt at that time. Yet Egypt, after that battle, uh, entered a, a, a period of a, a peaceful uh, political area, or era, sorry. But the Battle of Kadesh, you can see the scene of lots of the walls of this, uh, of this uh, temple, beautiful temple. Let's go ahead. This is the heart of the temple. Four statues of the king itself and other uh, uh, goddess who are sitting next to him. Only two times in a year, in February 22 and October 22, and only for five minutes as the sun rises and enters exactly into the temple, you have the chance, as I said, for a few minutes to see the light only on one of the statues that is on the statue of Ramses II. You can see him, he's sitting uh, second uh, to the right. Uh, this is showing us how genius were those ancient Egypt, Egyptians, how they could cal calculate 
the angles of the sun and the architecture. Just to give you in mind, the, 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 le- the distance from this inner room, it's the holy of the holiness inside the temple, to the entrance itself is something like 40 meters. So they need to calculate also with the time and only two times a year that the sun would be able to go inside. It's a kind of a miracle, a genius calculations of architecture and geometry and geography and the schedule of the, of the sun, the sunrise and the sunset. Let's go ahead. We go now to the north, to the city of Luxor. And here we see uh, a very big, one of the biggest buildings. It is much bigger than the temple of uh, Ramses II. We see here the temple of Queen Hatshepsut. Hatshepsut was a woman. She was a woman. Actually, she's uh, claimed to be the first ever uh, woman politician. The first ever uh, uh, woman. We're talking here about the 18th century uh, BC. She was uh, she was ruling Egypt more than uh, 350 years before Ramses II, and she built herself a beautiful uh, a palace. It was also a national place for people to come, but also a, a shrine that she was she made for herself. Let's let's go ahead and we see. Also in Luxor, on the east bank of the Nile, we see the great temples, because Luxor, uh, or in its ancient Hebrew name, Noamon, was the main city. Uh, okay, it was the main city, the capital city of Egypt at that time. It is 1,000 years after Moph that we spoke before, the Greek uh, Memphis. And here we have uh, one of the most famous uh, temples in Egypt, that is the temple of uh, uh, Karnak. It is very big. Let's go ahead. This is the entrance to the palace of Karnak. More than uh, 100 statues of uh, ram. Rams are uh, escorting you as you enter inside to the temple. They are still in the original location. Just to give you again the, the time and the, the age of this uh, very nice uh, entrance, it is more than 2,600 years ago. Let's move ahead. I, I like when I visit uh, those temples, I made the schedule of the day to visit them uh, in the evening. Just uh, 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 before dinner at something like 6.30, 30, 7. Uh, PM, everything is uh, has very nice lights. Take a look how it looks like. I mean, in Israel we have lots of archaeological uh, uh, amazing heritage sites, yet the the majority of them are under ruins. In Egypt, everything is still standing. They were not ruined because the desert uh, covered them with sand for hundreds of years, and it was only at the time of Napoleon and when he captured when he invaded uh, Egypt in 1799 that the uh, French archaeologists uh, cleaned those uh, temples and saw the real uh, so-called naked uh, uh, Egypt. So this is what you see here. Beautiful temples, beautiful columns and inscriptions on the walls. People are walking here. It, it's, it's unbelievable how, how it looks like. It looks like someone built it only five or ten years ago. Let's move ahead. Again, every statue is dedicated to a king or to a, or to a, one of the goddess of Egypt. Just to remind us, uh, there was a polytheism in each ancient Egypt. They had hundreds and hundreds of goddesses. Each god was uh, responsible, so-called, for a specific issue of life, for war, for love, for food, for drinking, for, for the sun, for everything. So they had a very rich culture that uh, each uh, god of them was related to each uh, king. Each king uh, said that he is connected very much to that specific uh, god. Try to imagine, guys, we're talking here about e- Egypt is in the desert. In the desert, there's no rain. It, there's more than 45 de- degrees, Celsius degrees, 10 months in the year, and they uh, developed here a civilization, a culture, that uh, with hundreds of goddesses and, and, and kings, 
and they ruled themselves for more than 3,000 years in the, in the desert with only one river. I mean, due to that, or according to the float of the Nile at that time. Let's proceed, please. As I said, in these worlds, it's not just for decoration. We have lots of knowledge and specifically information here about historical events. What you see here on this, uh, on this wall, we see here an information. Actually, it's a report. Imagine you see a, a report or an item on the, on the web today on the media. Here we have a report of a battle that uh, one of the kings of Egypt, he ruled and he captured Jaffa in Israel, in Canaan, Jaffa, and Megiddo, in the land of Israel. And we have here all the information. When I'm saying all the information, we see them in the hieroglyphs, in those uh, uh, signs and, uh, that you see uh, on, on the stone. And we have here an amazing information about the geography, the name, how long that the battle, the battle took time in Megiddo, and in Jaffa, how they entered Jaffa, from which road they captured, uh, they took uh, uh, the enemies, and so and so. We have lots of information from that time. Um, while we are sailing on the Nile, uh, we see, we see, uh, we have the chance to see lots of uh, temples. This is uh, the temple of Edfu, a small. Uh, Egyptian town, which is called Edfu today. But here we see the most preserved temple. Well, this uh, temple is not so old as Karnak and not so ancient as the first uh, step pyramid. Yet this is the most preserved and it more than 90, yeah, more than 90% of what you see today is original in its location. Uh, and it's from the uh, second uh, uh, century BC. So as you can see, it's not too old, but it's more than 2,100 years ago. And it still gives us a dimension of an ancient uh, Greek uh, temple. Because when the Greeks captured and uh, ruled Egypt for something like 300 years, they continued the legacy of the architecture and the language and all the practices that they learned from the ancient Egyptians. So what we see here is an example for a a Greek uh, temple in uh, Edfu in Egypt. Another one, just on the Nile, it's very close to the Mali, and the, the boat stops. By the way, the, the trips in Egypt, we do them in the south from Luxor to Aswan or from Aswan to Luxor. We do them with a very, on a boat, not a huge boat. It's a boat with something like 35 to 40 uh, cabins. And we just sail for four to five days on the Nile, which is amazing experience. And then we stop uh, twice a day uh, on near those temples. So here we have another temple. Let me stop uh, to have a look. This is the temple of Komombo. Here we see another, this, this temple is very uh, uh, compact. It's not so big. Uh, again, it's from the Greek uh, period. That is the first century uh, BC. But all the Egyptian principles of building and uh, urban planning and uh, architecture are inside this beautiful building. Those of you who are uh, working as uh, physicians or doctors would love to hear that here on one of the walls in the temple of Komombo, we, what you see here now, this is one of the fewer examples of an information of a hospital and a pharmacy. Uh, take a look on the left, you see there a figure of a woman who is uh, kind of uh, in a position of sitting. Well, guys, she's about to uh, give birth in a few minutes. She's sitting in a way like that. You see her on the lower uh, figure, she's uh, half naked. And what you see on the on the right side, I mean, in the middle of the picture, in the middle of the wall, you see all the operation tools of the physicians of that time. It's like a medical report that you can find after you're doing any kind of a medical treatment. Here on the right side, you have the medical report. You can read everything. On the uh, most right side, 
we have also uh, words and sentences describing the whole procedure that they did for this specific uh, woman. At this point, we know that they are helping her to deliver uh, the baby. Okay. The Nile, the River Nile, every year in the time of September and October is uh, rising in something like uh, 50, 60, if sometimes to 80 centimeters due to the rains to, in its sources in Ethiopia. So the Egyptians need to know in advance when the time, when is the time of uh, the flood in order to prepare, in order not to destroy, to, so the flood would, would not destroy their houses and the vegetations in their agricultural fields. So they used to build shafts or nilometers. This is a shaft. It's a nilometer. It is con it's on the ground. It's in the temple or near the temple. And it is only something, it's something like 50, 60 meters from the river, the bank of the river Nile. And you know, like uh, uh, the, the rule of the rotor, the balance of the water, once the water is rising, they could know and they were learning it and writing it in their, their diaries in order to learn for the next year about the patterns of the floods of the Nile. So Egypt had lots of uh, nilometers. Let's go ahead. We are still in the temple of Komombo. The archaeologist and the uh, Egyptologist, they found her in this temple. Uh, more than 100 mummies of uh, crocodiles. Here you see on the left side, there's a small exhibition over there near the temple, a modern exhibition. They're just uh, showing us something like uh, 12 uh, mummified crocodiles from the second uh, uh, century BC. Again, th these are not sculptures and uh, neither bones. These are real crocodiles uh, mummified. The mummification was not only for humans. Yeah, as you can see, mummification was for crocodiles. Um, not far from there, we are back in, the, in the, the valley of the kings. I mean, we spoke about the temples, but the temples were made, were built for the common people to come and see the kings. But after the kings passed away, they were buried in the Valley of the Kings on the west bank of the Nile. And here we can see some entries to one of, one of those uh, tombs which, which are underground. So let's go inside, please. Every, every uh, system of uh, 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 graves looks something like that. You come from the, from the desert, from the up, you, then you go inside, there's one hall, uh, stairway and then the lower hall and in the middle of the of that hall you can see the sarcophagus the the where the the, the mummy fit mummy of the king or the queen is inside so this is a model what you see here only an illustration let's see the real thing now let's have a look that's the real thing guys you're you just buy a ticket Please don't go there on the summer. Please go to Egypt only on the winter, unless you like something like 45 to 50 degrees Celsius. So once you're there in the winter, you buy the ticket, you just go down in the stairs and you visit like the ancient Egyptians. You see everything, all the colors and figures and inscriptions on the walls and on the ceilings are original because there's no humidity in Egypt, because there is no rain to destroy this. It's not like the land of Israel or Europe that you have lots of, uh, or Greece or uh, Rome, that you have lots of uh, uh, rainfall. There's no rainfall in Egypt. Everything is dry. Everything was covered with sand until 250 years ago. So you just go inside, you put some light, you put some modern stairs and take a look what you see. So much information. It's just not only decoration, it's information. Let's go ahead. And here we stand in front of the the, the, the lower uh, the lower room with uh, with the tomb itself of uh, the in, in this case this is the tomb of uh, Queen Nefertari, the one of the wives of uh, uh, Ramses II, the famous pharaoh. Okay. 
Again, on the walls, you see uh, two kinds of figures. I mean, on the right side, you see a, an event. This is a, a picture. Uh, and if you don't understand what you see, you need to read the hieroglyphs on the right side and on the left side. It's not just, uh, it, these are letters like A, B, and C or Aleph, B, and Gimel. Here you can see a description of all the details of these two uh, uh, women who are meeting, of Nefertari and a friend of her. Let's go. <coughs> you cannot uh, talk about Egypt without mentioning one of the famous, most famous kings in humankind, uh, that is King uh, Tutankhamun. Tutankhamun uh, was the son of uh, Nefertiti. This is what we think today. It's not a 100%, but if you've been in the, the Egyptian Museum in Berlin and you've seen the famous uh, torso and uh, head of uh, Nefertiti, uh, she's, she's claimed to be the mother of uh, Tutankhamun. Um, and his father was named uh, Akhnaton. Now, the famous thing with, uh, his name was Tut, that's, that's his name, but at some age he put uh, the word uh, Amon in order to get connected more to the uh, father of the goddess of Egypt, Amon, but he also put another word in Hebrew, in Egypt, Egyptian, ancient Egyptian, to his name, which calls Anch, as you can see it in the middle, Tut, Anch, Amon, it's actually three, three um, uh, uh, letters. Okay, and Anch means eternity. Well, he didn't help him a lot in his life. Tutankhamun was uh, murdered. It's one of the first political uh, murders uh, in the history. He was murdered at the age of 18 or 19 by people in the nation at that time who did not uh, 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 believe in his way. Uh, actually, he, he made a rebel against his father, Akhnaton, and he, he made uh, Egypt uh, to be uh, uh, polytheistic again, believing, uh, trusting after many gods. His father was, said that for a short time, Egypt was come to be a, a monotheistic uh, culture, uh, way of thinking, but uh, not for a long time. So this is why they killed him. And in only in his eight, he became a king at the age of 10 when he was a boy. Yet the people spoiled him a lot with, uh, with toys, with presents. And some of them you could see in his tomb. Let's go inside. Just to remind us, we are still in the Valley of the Kings near Luxor. This is the original picture uh, of the archaeologists that uh, were found actually this year, remember, November the 4th, 1922, Professor Howard Carter, he was the one who found with the locals, he found the original uh, untouched uh, tube of Tutankhamun in the Valley of the Kings. As I said, it's, it's almost in the end of this year, it will be 100 years for this uh, amazing discovery. And they found him inside hundreds and hundreds of items Personal items belong, used to belong to that uh, boy king, Tutankhamun. You see some of them here, Howard Carter. Today, as you in, go inside the tube, you see the real uh, mummy of Tutankhamun. This is what you see here. This is the king. You see his head on the left, his toes on the right side. The mummy of Tutankhamun. Let's go. This is uh, Professor Howard Carter and his uh, local assistant, the Egyptian one, when they are discovering in November 1922, the real sarcophagus and the box which the mummy of uh, Tutankhamun was inside, still in situ. Later on, it, uh, it has been uh, removed to the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. And just, uh, I think, yeah, um, just uh, a year ago, Egypt uh, opened a new uh, museum for ancient civilization and 25 uh, mummies of uh, ancient kings, uh, along with this one, has been removed to that uh, new museum in Cairo, okay? 
Back to Cairo, back to Giza. Take a look. Uh, I took this uh, picture from the from the plane. You see, I mean, sometimes you see it from the even from space. In space uh, pictures, you see it. Uh, satellites uh, picture, sorry. You see the three uh, famous uh, pyramids of Giza. Actually, these are three tubes of three of, of three kings from three legacies. The left one, the big one, uh, was built by King Khufu, and he, this is his tomb. Then the second one on, on the middle, it is his son, Khefra, and his son, that is the grandfather, the grandson, sorry, of Khufu, the run on the right side, the small one, belongs to Menkaura. So a grandfather, a father, and, uh, uh, sorry, a father, a son, and grandson are buried here in those three pyramids. And as I said before, uh, from the 24th century BC, it's in uh, Giza. This whole area used to be the uh, cemetery, the cemetery for the kings of the, the first legacies of Egypt. What you see on the left side, the big, the modern, this is the modern city of uh, Giza, which is a part of uh, modern Cairo of today. Okay. Over here, you can have a, a, a description, I mean, a, a new one, a modern one, kind of an illustration, how those places, how these pyramids looked like probably in, in the ancient times, before all the things were dis under destruction of all the nations who uh, ruled uh, Egypt. It was kind of a memorial site, a national memorial site for those kings. You can see the pyramids inside. You can see, you can see the boats are sending on the Nile, arriving to the temples and then entering uh, the pyramid, which were actually uh, the tombs of, of the kings. Let's proceed. Um, in winter times, you could see the, the pyramids from not central Cairo, but there is a, one of the viewpoints that you can see in Cairo, which is a bit a small kind of a hill. Once you take a look to the south, you can see it's a distance of something like uh, six to, yeah, it's something like eight kilometers. And you can see the pyramids uh, from far, just above the, the clouds. It's, it's amazing, uh, amazing picture. Let's go. Um, well, I didn't take the, the the black and white picture on the left, but uh, you could see here the famous Sphinx. Sphinx, he's, he's the guard, he's the guardian of the cemetery. It's a body of a lion and a head of a king, an Egyptian king, as you can see. Um, but what you see on the right side, it, how it looks today from the, in the front, from the front. But the picture on the left, I mean, the ancient, the, the old one, was taken only at the end of the 19th century, the beginning of the 20th century. We had lots of pictures of the Sphinx and the pyramids from that time, but you can see the Sphinx is buried in the sand. It's very, it's a very modern uh, situation that we have the Sphinx as it is cleaned with no sand on it. It is not buried uh, anymore. And by the way, exca archeological excavations are still there uh, uh, day by day in that place. And they find they have new findings every day, just as they're doing all over Egypt. Let's go ahead. And this is how it looks today. You just go, uh, no words needed. You just go uh, off your bus and you just go visit uh, the pyramid. This is the, uh, uh, the, the, big, the biggest pyramid, the pyramid of Hufo, remember? The king who is buried here inside. Um, it is a, an amazing uh, build, uh, building. I mean, that's the only uh, wonder. I mean, you know, in ancient times, we had seven wonders of the world, not those modern ones, the ancient ones. Uh, six of them has been destroyed, and we don't know exactly where are the remains. There's only one uh, world, uh, uh, things like that, which is here in Giza, the big pyramid of Hufo over here. It is a perfect uh, geometry and the uh, golden, uh, um, the connection and the ratio between the, the lines and the height and the diameters and the volume and everything is just 
perfect and we don't there are, there are a few theories how they build the the, the pyramids yet uh it, it's a it's a it's a mystery until the building of the the eiffel tower in uh, paris in 19th century this was the highest building in the world more than uh, i mean the original was 148 meters today it's only 139 because someone stole the last uh, stone from the top which is called pyramidion which is connected uh, uh, which was made of of uh, of gold um let's see the, the other picture yeah we are jumping from uh, giza back to the south the border of egypt and africa uh the most my beloved city in egypt is aswan it's uh, once you reach to aswan in the south you hardly think you can still in uh, in Egypt. It, you you understand it now. You're in Africa um, because of the weather, which is more, uh, hotter. Because you're uh, of the angle of the sun, especially because of the people. There are Nubians here. They are more black faced. Uh, they, are, they are not Arabs. They are coming from Africa, not from Arabia. Aswan is very unique because the, there is a lots of uh, archaeological sites here related to the Jewish uh, history. Let's see one of them. Let's go ahead, please. And when I'm talking about the uh, Jewish uh, uh, heritage, I'm talking about uh, the island of Elephantine. And if it sounds to you very similar to the, the name elephant, you're right. <laughs> it used to be called uh, the island of the elephants because uh, traders brought uh, uh, ivory from Africa on the river, on the Nile, to this place. And here on this island, there was a community of Jewish people living here more than 400 years from the uh, 7th century BC to the 4th 7th, 7th century BC. And they were dealing with the commercial of the ivory coming from Africa. So this is why the Hebrew name of this place is Yev or Hav. And if you know the Hebrew word for ivory, which means it calls Shen Hav, you probably understand that it is related to this place. Shen Hav. Shen is a teeth. Hav is an elephant in ancient Egyptian uh, language. So here they found uh, remains from this uh, Jewish community. And there's also a legacy saying that maybe the, the Ark of the Covenant, which was brought from Jerusalem, taken or brought or stolen from Jerusalem, maybe it was lying here for a few years before it reached uh, Ethiopia, that's the version of the Ethiopians. Anyhow, in the Bible, we have a, in, um, in uh, the book of uh, Joshua, Joshua, they are saying that the, there was a temple for the Ark in the border of Egypt. This is here in Aswan. Let's see the other uh, picture. Here on the right side of this picture, we are still in the Elephantine Island. There was a synagogue the synagogue of the community of the Jews of Yev, or Yeb in, in English. And it was only at the beginning of the 20th century that when German and, and uh, French archaeologists made kind of a few seasons of researchers here, and they found uh, more than 30 uh, papers and ostracons and papyrus with information about the everyday lives of the Jewish community that was living here for hundreds of years in uh, this island of Yev. Many of the things that I spoke about them from Luxor, from uh, the Valley of the Kings, from Elephantine Island, uh, from Abu Simbel, and from all the other temples, at the end of the 19th century, the British colonialists ruled Egypt for 40 years, from 1882 to 1922, they brought them to this special uh, museum that they built in Cairo, the Egyptian Museum. Excuse me. <coughs> well, there are more than 50 Egyptian museums in the world, 50. Um, the Metropolitan in New York. Um, the second one, the best one is in uh, uh, Torino in Italy. 
and also in the Louvre in, in the Paris, in London also. But the best Egyptian museum in the world is, of course, in Cairo. And this is what you see here. An amazing of more than 100,000 items and such a rich archaeology and pictures and items and uh, mummies that were removed, as I said, to a new museum just uh, lately. But anyhow, a visit in this museum is a great experience. Let's move ahead. Here you can see uh, the process of the mummification, the, the coffin and the mummy inside. And again, when I'm saying a mummy, it's not just, it's not just bones. You see the skin, you see uh, the face. Uh, you can make a, an MRI test for these uh, mummies and you can learn almost everything about the medical uh, status and situation of the person inside. And you have all the information written on the top of the coffin. What's his name, where he lived, what's his age, whatever, and everything. Also, inside every coffin like that, there is the scroll of life, more than 22 meters of a papyrus uh, uh, roll with, with all the information. It's like a value in the Wikipedia. You, can, you open it and you can read everything about that a person. And again, we're talking, this specific one is the grandfather of, uh, of Tutankhamun, the King uh, Tuya, which was found over there in the Valley of the Kings and was brought here to the museum. Here is one of the golden boxes, which the coffin of Tutankhamun was inside. The mummy of Tutankhamun was put inside a coffin, sarcophagus, and that one was put inside a box, and then another box, a total of four boxes, four golden boxes. What you see here is the bigger one. You can see some uh, for proportions, the other, the visitors of the museum. And everything of that was underground inside the tomb, which was, as I said, discovered for the first time ever and it's the first uh, the only untouched uh, a tomb in Egypt the tomb of Tutankhamun November the 4th 1922 Professor Howard Carter to my opinion as an Israeli as, an, as a researcher uh, the main attraction of the Egyptian museum is this uh, is this uh, stela this is a stela of Merneptah um, you remember the negotiations between Israel and Egypt uh, in the 1970s before the peace agreement? Uh, Menachem Begin, the Prime Minister, visited uh, Egypt a few times. When he visited this museum, uh, he was standing just in front of this uh, stella, and when he heard the history of this, play, this item, he said to uh, President Sadat, can I have this back to Jerusalem? I want to have it in Jerusalem, in the Israel Museum. So King, uh, sorry, President Sadat told him, I think you can forget about this. Let's do and speak about the present uh, uh, peace uh, treaty. So the still, still, Stella remained in Cairo. Why Menachem Begin wanted it to have it back to, uh, to have it back to Israel? Because uh, in this place, in, in this Stella, it's made of granite. It is the first ever, the first time that the, the word Israel is mentioned ever after a battle that Queen King Merneptah from Egypt made in uh, Canaan, the land of Israel in the 13th century BC. Let's see what is written here in translation to English. It says here on the left, the no, no, it's okay. The Canaan has been plundered into every sort of woe. Ashkelon, it's the real Ashkelon in Israel, has been overcome. Gezer also, it's in the central parts of Israel, has overcome, has been uh, overcome. Uh, sorry, has been captured. Yanoam, it's a long place in the Galilee, is made non-existent. And take a look. Israel is laid waste and his seed is not. Again, it's called the Merneptah Stila or the Israel Stila. And the first time uh, that the word Israel is mentioned ever. It's very unique. Okay. Guys, I hope this uh, short and uh, again, sorry for the delay, uh, was enough to give you lots of things to think about them uh, <laughs> one week from now, where, while we are sitting at the table of the center, 
Israel and Egypt are not just neighbors. They are related in time and to ancient civilizations. And again, the place where our nation was born, the base, the first, our first narratives, narrative. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad we waited and worked it out. It was a terrific uh, visit. I, I visited Egypt once and it was quite a few years ago. I'm trying to figure out what year it was, probably 1990, 1989, 1990. So um, here are a few questions that I got from people. We have just a few minutes because we, we're so late. But first question is, um, when I was there in 1990, it was a disaster trying to get around Cairo. I mean, it was, you know, you had two roads, two lane roads, but you had five lanes driving all different directions. It, it's a sea of, te it's sea, a teeming sea of people. Um, the only place in the world that I found that was more challenging was uh, traveling in India. Have things changed in Cairo or is it still the same if we go to visit? Worse, I mean, worse. So people should know that. When you go to Cairo, and how many people do you take on your groups? Um, I, I limit it to a maximum of 20. 20. I can take even 200, but I think for the comfortable of my clients and even for myself. I think 20 is enough because once you visit all the temples inside, you need to have to be specific, kind of a, a small group. And uh, 20 is my optimum. And don't worry about the, the traffic jams and the, and the hustle and bustle of Cairo. Um, it's a matter of preparing in advance. And once you go back home, you remember the good things and the good uh, experiences. I mean, Egypt is amazing, yeah. The people were amazing. I remember that. Very friendly. Um, so you talked about Israel having good relations for a while. It was a very cold piece. When did it change from your perspective to a, a much warmer relationship? Good question. I think uh, the change has become, you know, we all know uh, there was a coup, a political coup in Egypt uh, 11 years ago. It started in tw uh, 2010. The peak was in 2011. Since then, I mean, since uh, uh, President Assisi is um, is the president from 2014, everything is becoming more uh, related. Egypt is still not a democracy. They, they still have far away to do. They, were, they are not claiming, their, their vision is not to be a democracy. Their vision is to be a strong and to be independent and to deal with uh, tourism and that's it. And I'm very much... They have a threat from Ethiopia. That uh, dam, which is Ethiopia is building, it is about to be opened in the next uh, year and a half, and it is a kind of a threat to the Egyptian economy because the Egypt is afraid that Ethiopia will change the balance and the quantity of water coming from Ethiopia to Egypt. Anyhow, Egypt today is um, dealing also with the climate change uh, issues. By the way, the next... Um, Con uh, international convention about climate change. The last one was in Glasgow, you know, a few months ago. The next one will be in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh in Sinai in Egypt in October this year. So Egypt is very much doing lots of processes to be um, more modern. They are calling themselves, we are the new Arabs, not the old ones, the new Arabs. So do you, so you feel safe taking groups there? Do you think it's safe for people to go oh. traveling these days? Of course. Of course, um, I, I'm traveling to Egypt every winter only twice because I'm busy with other things. And I think twice is in the, again, only in the winter from December to beginning of March. Um, if I could, I, I'm, I had lots and lots of uh, proposals for going to Egypt. There's, we, there's, not, there's not enough uh, seats in the planes and not enough guides to take groups of that. The, 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 there's lots of... Uh, inquiries of uh, people who want to visit Egypt from Israel. I'm talking about Israelis. Do, um, when I was there, Israelis like to go there, particularly for Passover break, which is ironic. Is that still the case? Oh, yes, yes. It's very, it's very symbolic. And well, the, it's the, the wrong looking, direction. <laughs> the wrong direction and the wrong story, as we spoke in the beginning. They're standing, some of them, in front of the pyramid, saying, oh, our people build it. Uh, no, we didn't build the pyramids. We could not. They were built 1,000 years before Moses. So uh, people, well, Sue Arbuck asked a question, but I'll, let me ask the first question. Why do you think the story of having the Jews build the pyramids is the story that we 
hear today or have heard for many years? So, because sometimes in history, uh, uh, people are connecting and sticking one information to another one, and it's very easier, and it's also it's serving the interest. Um, the people of Israel, the Hebrews, as they were calling in, in ancient Egypt, Ha'ivrim, they were one of the nations from Asia, Canaan is Asia, that were brought or arrived to Egypt. We, are, we were not the only ones. There were also nations from other parts of Asia and from Africa and from Ethiopia coming as slaves to Egypt. They were coming as slaves. So we were not the only ones. We, I mean, we, the, the Hebrew nation had a kind of a small autonomy in the northeast uh, section of the Delta, the land of Goshen, as I said before. And over there, there are no pyramids. Well, our fathers, ancestors, they, they were slaves and they built buildings for the king, but not the pyramids. Why? I mean, there is no archaeological, necessarily, I don't think so, you know, the archaeological evidence of ancient Hebrews, Israels in Egypt. So why are you so sure as the location as to where Goshen was? Because we have uh, evidence and information about uh, Asian peoples named Hyksos. In the, in the, in the ancient uh, Egyptian uh, information that we get from the walls of the temples in Memphis, in Luxor, all over. We all know, it's, it's a historical fact. That there was a, there were all these Asian people arriving to Egypt. They were called the Hyksos, and one of them uh, has uh, information that they are coming from the west part of Asia. That is the land of Israel. That is Canaan, you know, ancient Canaan. So there are, if you connect this and lots of other information. Uh, and also uh, information about this tradition of believing in one God, uh, that is uh, the father of uh, Tutankhamun, his name was Akhnaton. If you connect everything, you have prepared, you have a whole myth that connected that our nation was uh, at the, at, in Egypt at the time that uh, Akhnaton was talking about that monotheistic uh, religion. So maybe that, uh, that those people, the ancient Hebrews, learned something about the monotheistic uh, tradition. And there was one leader of them, his name is Moses, who took this principle, took this idea, and started to lead, uh, to lead that nation in front of the Pharaoh, uh, Ramses II. So, I mean, again, you know, people are saying that today that they can claim that some events did not uh, happen uh, 10 years ago, 70 years ago, and you know what I mean. So how can you go and claim about the events and situations that took place something like 3,700 years ago? It's complicated. A few last questions. Tom wants to know that and we, you mentioned a lot of um, Israelis are going to Egypt. Do Egyptians come to travel to Israel? No. Is that because no. of cost issues or other barriers? <sighs> The, the relationship between Israel and uh, Egypt are between the countries, not between the nations. I mean, it's only uh, it's only one way. I mean, once the Israelis are meeting the Egyptians in Egypt, it's very nice and peaceful and economy and tourism and uh, commercial. But Egyptians, the people themselves, they are not uh, coming to Al-Aqsa Mosque in uh, Jerusalem to pray. Uh, still after more than 40 years after the peace agreement between the countries, there's still hesitation in the Egyptian society regarding to Israel. As I guess, I mean, everybody knows it's due to the general atmosphere of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So they still see Israel as something else. I mean, the Moroccan people, I, I'm, I'm traveling to Morocco uh, next week. Uh, once you drive Morocco, uh, Jordan, other Arab countries are not treating Israel like that. In Egypt, it's something unique. Maybe it's because we had four wars in 25 years. And also, okay, until 1948, 56, 67, and 73. And we have two generations. We are after the Yom Kippur war. But maybe it's, it's, 
we still more we need a more, one more generation to change that the relations would be would be more warm i don't know um sue arbuck asked a question have you been to the new museum that you mentioned and what do you think about it is it worth going to what's the highlights low I mean, yes it... yes but you, you need time the problem is if you want to see everything in cairo uh, when we travel to cairo to egypt we do uh, the classical tour of eight to nine days and then we see we do cairo luxor uh, Aswan and Abu Simbel. But if you want to see all the things in Cairo, you need another day at least or two. All the museums and all the attractions, and it's it's very rich. Well, you said, Arya, at the beginning, you're right. Before coming to Egypt, to Cairo specifically, uh, you need to be aware of the traffic jams and the have, but it's safe. The, the hotels are modern and great. And it's a matter of how to manage the day, the schedule. It's a Better to wake up early a bit and go to the tour. Uh, many people are doing this. There's, it's not just, if you want to see everything, you will do it. I was very lucky, as I mentioned, to get to Egypt <laughs> as a, a young, unattached man, my friend, Robert Charlie. <laughs> and we made our way down to Abu Simbel. It was a long trip, but I remember taking a train and sleeping. And we didn't have much money back then. So we stayed at very... I mean, at one uh, at one point, I felt like we were staying in a homeless encampment, but it was a hotel. Yes, yes, so I, yes. If I go back, I'm staying in nice places. You can tell tell me where to well, stay. Well, if you do it today, you'll do it with uh, internal flights and with a nice luxury uh, boat on the on the Nile. Sounds good to me. I'll tell my wife. <laughs> we'll get the kids. Um, so, but but going back to Abu Simbel, is a question. You talked about the light coming in on two occasions through the year. Was this why those specific? Um, okay, like dates did the light like, that they design it to come in on those dates those two dates are the dates of uh, the birthday of Ramses II and the coronation day of Ramses II when today it's uh, February 22nd and October 22nd until uh, 50 years ago it was uh, February 21 21st and October 21st it has been changing a day because of remember the relocation of the statues from the what is today water and lake they preserved it and uh, saved it so they changed it the, the angle of the entry of the sun ray has been changed for a, a day ahead it's gorgeous and, right and just and just to make sure because i think you mentioned before you generally take israeli tourists right you don't take do you take do you do groups like csp or is that like i mean are your groups primarily hebrew speaking israelis I can, I'm guiding also English speaking groups from abroad. And the only problem is that I'm <laughs> to, to, to take, a, to find a place where I, I'm available for the next winter. For the, right. That's the whole point. Because I'm doing only two or three tours per winter. Okay. Um, but uh, yes, it's, a, uh, but I think it's better to do it with not a huge groups. Good um, to know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, I think we have to end there because it is now later. We we stay, thank you all for staying late, by the way, and um, it was worth the program. So, um, and thank you for a tour of ancient um, Egypt. Next week, you come back. Tell us what we're gonna, what's in part two. What are we going to see next week with you? First of all, next week next week I'm going to do my efforts to be here an hour in advance, Arya, and we'll we will play right. with our electronics here at the presentation. We'll talk about modern Egypt, about Islam, about Judaism synagogues, uh, the Geniza, the famous uh, Jewish Geniza uh, in Cairo. We'll talk about the political conflict uh, with Ethiopia on the, on the dam. That's the main threat on Egypt today. Hmm. That's okay. the main threat. And uh, yeah. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us. Hope you enjoyed your virtual trip to um, Egypt and to the ancient part of Egypt. Egypt. Next week, modern um, Egypt should get you in the mode for your Passover. And um, we'll see you uh, on Thursday when we go into the mind of God, if you're willing to go there. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Thank you, Benny. Thank you for making it work out. Thank you, everybody, everybody for being patient. Goodbye. Good night from Jerusalem. See you soon. Good night. Sleep tight. Bye-bye. Thank you.